Hey everyone. So tonight is WWE Elimination Chamber within the next uh, 11 hours and 20 minutes. Um, I'll be, you know, getting off work or at least be in the final 15 minutes of work uh, when that starts off. And I will try to watch it on my phone while I'm on my lift ride back home uh, to try to see what's going on and everything kind of catch up and then maybe finish watching it when I get home. But before I get into that, and I will timestamp these uh, two um, items here so you guys can look at one item and then look at the other, you know, when you get a chance. But right here at 45 seconds, I want to I wanna talk about something really interesting. You see, last night, you know, SmackDown was in the Bell Center. Basically, WWE did a double booking of the Bell Center in Montreal, you know, for SmackDown and Elimination Chamber. They, in, they even showed on SmackDown that they already had the chamber set up and ready to go for tonight. And um, during SmackDown, um, Ariel Hawani, Ariel Hawani of the MMA Hour, you know, here on YouTube, which is a very popular podcast, you know, all across the board on YouTube, Spotify, you name it, uh, who also works for BT, you know, in their partnership with WWE as well. And, you know, where he does interviews like with Triple H, you know, Sami Zayn, Edge, you name it. <coughs> you know, Cody Rhodes. And even uh, people outside of WWE, like those that work for uh, Impact, MLW, maybe even AEW uh, to an extent. Um, anyway, though, uh, Tony Khan... Uh, to, not Tony. Well, I'll get into Tony Khan in a moment because he does tie into this. Anyway, Ariel Hawani was in attendance last night on SmackDown, interviewing, you know, interviewing um, in the audience fans and getting their legit thoughts on what they see being the outcome for tonight's Elimination Chamber event, as far as like the Chamber matches themselves go, uh, the two uh, non-Chamber matches, as well as the main event, specifically the main event. And Tony Khan obviously was watching, saw this, and called Ariel Hawani out. But at the same time, he basically, um, I guess as the old saying goes, put one of his own under the bu bus uh, when he called Ariel out. Yeah. This is what he said, and I quote. You know, and this was 11 hours ago. Again, he basically called out Ariel Hawani when he saw him doing these, you know, fan interviews, getting their legit thoughts and everything on SmackDown last night. Because Ariel Hawani, like I said, also works with BT, which is partners with WWE. This is, this is why he gets mostly a lot of WWE interviews, with the exception here and there. And he was in the audience interviewing fans. And like I said, Tony Khan caught wind, you know, caught wind of this. He saw it. And he, not only did he call out Ariel Hawani, but like I said, he threw one of his own under the bus. And you're not going to be, and you'll be very surprised of who he threw under the bus. Because this is what he said 11 hours ago when he saw Ariel Hawani on SmackDown. He says, and I quote, You're a fraud, Ariel Hawani. You're as legitimate of a reporter as Tony Schiavone. That's right. The same Tony Schiavone that does play-by-play -play and color commentary for him on most of his AEW programming. The same Tony Giovanni he has stood side by side with when they would talk about certain events in the Control Center or when they did the Impact Invasion storyline with Kenny Omega. You know, basically, it, that, that, that person, that person he stood alongside with is who he threw under the bus. Because, again, this is what he said to Ariel Hawani. He says, you're a fraud, Ariel Hawani. You're as legitimate of a reporter as Tony Giovanni. And to me, why would you put one of your own under the bus? Why would you throw them under the bus? You know, because somebody else who basically came out, you know, and out of the goodness of their heart, invited you to do an interview with them on their own show, the MMA Hour. Nothing associated with BT, but their own show, the MMA Hour. And basically afterwards say it was the most awkward, most unprofessional interview they've ever had which obviously got under your skin that you're willing to basically, I guess you could say, call them out for not being a legit reporter all because the, for, for what, a one night, two night deal because of BT, the partnership with BT is, you know, you know, helping WWE. And because of that, you want to throw one of your own under the bus by saying, hey, you're not a real reporter. 
Just like Tony Giovanni's not a real reporter. Excuse me? Excuse me? You are you are throwing under the bus one of the greatest wrestling color commentators, one of the greatest wrestling play-by-play -play announcers in the history of any generation. You know, in the history of my generation, in the history of the current generation, in the history of the generations that grew up in the 80s and 90s. You are throwing one of the greatest voices out there under the bus because you want to call somebody out that basically you know, honest to God said, hey, this interview I had with the owner of All Elite Wrestling was the most awkward interview I have ever had. You want to call that person out by throwing one of your own under the bus because you don't like the fact that he's on camera, you know, maybe for a two-night deal working with WWE by interviewing fans. And, it, and because of that, it gets under your skin to the point that you throw one of your own, one of the greatest announcers in the business, under the bus. And then, and let me remind you of something too, folks. And Tony Khan, I don't know if you're watching, but let me remind you of something too. This man, along with Vince McMahon, along with Jerry Lawler, along with Jim Ross, okay, this man, along with Mike Tenay, and to an extent, Eric Bischoff, these people commentating and play-by-play -play wise were the voices of the Monday Night War era. There would not be any interest, you know, in Monday Nitro, in Monday Night Raw, you know, outside of the matches and stories they were giving without the storytellers and the commentary that accompanied it. And this man, Tony Schiavone, along with Eric Bischoff, to an extent, and Mike Tenay, and, you know, during the later years, Scott Hudson, you know, for WCW were the voices of that era were the voices of the WCW side of the war. You know, and the same goes for people like Jim Ross, Vince McMahon, you know, to an extent, Michael Cole has, become, has gone on to be one of his own, one of the greatest, if you will. These people are what gave, gave fans a reason to tune in every week because of the storytelling and the commentating they would provide. And for you, Tony Khan, to shove one of the greatest, even if, you th even if you're going to go out and say, oh, it was in jest, don't worry, Shivani, it was in jest. If you're going to go and throw one of the greatest under the bus, a man you have stood side by side with when you would do those control center things to promote weekly dynamites and rampages and pay-per-views, to you know, promote AEW better than Impact, doing that invasion, AEW Impact partnership in versus um, storyline that you were doing along with Kenny Omega. For you to take that man and throw him under the bus, whether you, whether or not you were drinking, probably you probably were drinking, there's no doubt because a lot of people don't think coherently when they drink a lot, or you were doing something, it's still not an excuse. It's still not an excuse. And you shouldn't let somebody that is one that is considered one of the more elite, you know, podcasters and interviewers out there across all boards, wrestling, mixed martial arts, boxing, sports in general. You shouldn't let their honest opinion get under your skin. Because again, it wasn't BT that said, hey, go interview Tony Khan and ask him certain questions, da 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 da. No, he, out of the goodness of his heart, you know, knowing it could provide viewership numbers for his podcast, listener numbers for his podcast, asked you on board. He asked you on board, and you. Gave him an interview that he felt, at the end of the day, was probably the most unprofessional, most worst interview he has ever dealt with. And for you to come out and throw and call and say he's a fraud, and at the same time throw one of your own under the bus, whether you are on something or not, is not a good look for you, and by extension, it's not a good look for your company. I mean, it's no wonder numbers are dwindling, and it's not because of what I mentioned in a previous video which is about the venue size. No, it's because, you know, people are starting to realize that this person, this guy running the company, he doesn't, he really doesn't know much about wrestling except, ooh, let's have another flips and kicks kind of, you know, gymnastics-like event. You know, that's what they're viewing. That's what they're viewing. Yeah, they see a few golden gems 
here and there, but they don't see anything else outside of that. And that's what's causing, you know, the viewership to lack. This is causing it to lack in general. Not just because of the venue size, like I said, which I mentioned in a previous video, and I'll get into that at um, in that video, which you could probably watch, you know, before or after this. But you know, you wonder why people are tuning out AEW, not in the droves, thank God, but you know, in ways that surprise a lot of people. It's not because WWE is getting a lot of momentum. It's not because we're heading into a time of year where March Madness is going to you know, rear its ugly head and pretty much cause you to have to move dynamite to another night or later on in the evening or earlier in the evening. It's not because of that. It's because they could see that you, without something to do, are just, you are just bored. I mean, it's like I said in that live stream I did before work a couple of days ago. It's like, you know, since, you know, the NFL season is over, we don't know when the Premier League soccer te season's going you know, are going to happen again, you have nothing to do. You have nothing better to do. You are bored. You have nothing to occupy your mind. You have nothing to occupy your mind. And now, all of a sudden, you decide, now is the best time to do a special announcement. Big announcement. Oh, what's the announcement? Ring of Honor is going to premiere March 2nd on Honor Club? We know that. We know that. So whatever your announcement is, Better be something gets people talking. Because what it sounds like to a lot of people, when you're doing something like that, it's desperation. It's desperation for the fact that you know that momentum you once had is pretty much in the favor of WWE now. And it's fl and what it's doing is it's frustrating you. It's a flabbergation with you. It's frustrating you to no end. That's what it's doing, Tony. And it's doing, to, doing it to you more now because you have nothing else to occupy your mind. So my suggestion to you, TK, find something to occupy your mind and don't worry about someone that basically, out of the goodness of the heart, invited you onto their show, their own show, you know, to do an interview. And for them, giving their own opinion, saying it was the most awkward interview they've ever done. Because guess what? That is their opinion. That's their opinion. Because, you know, if they feel that way, if they believe that, to be true, then hey, you know, don't let it get under your skin. Don't let it get under your skin. Maybe the next time they feel, hey, I want to I want to invite you back on, maybe it'll be a lesson for you. Maybe them making that con uh, that critical commentary will be a lesson for you to be like, okay, next time I come on board, I'm going to have to be more professional. I'm going to have to be more like, okay, ask me anything you want, and I'll try my best to answer it. That's all you can do. That's all you can do is learn from that last interview if you get invited back on to his show or anybody's show. Period. But yeah, for, for you to say say this, it definitely shows that WWE is getting under your skin and, and everything. And it's not just because of the contract tampering and all that as you're pointing out. No, it's because of the fact that that momentum you once had is pretty much now in the favor of WWE and it's affecting you in many ways. And one of the things that's affecting you in many ways, like I said, is the venue stuff. And I, like I said, I talked about that in another video that you'll see before or after this. Yeah, but you gotta... You gotta wonder how Shivani feels about this. You know... You gotta wonder how Shivani feels about this. I mean, Ariel... Ariel, this is what he said in response ten, you know, ten hours ago. He said, "Thanks for watching, old friend. Can't wait for our next chat." And then he puts in the uh, apostrophes. He says, "Also, don't listen to the snowman, Shivani. You're a legend in my book." And here's the thing: when he put that little emphasis of snowman, basically, I think that's Ariel's way of saying, "Don't listen to the guy that's probably cocaining it up right now." and everything and thus he's not thinking straight in what he says and all that so um so yeah i'm you know that's it so yeah that's his opinion that basically he feels that the reason you know uh tk said that is because of the fact that he's probably drugged up right now and then tk responds by saying good luck with the unbiased journalism and everything and then of course we have jd 
uh, responding. We have a few people. We have Leo Sanders of the RC WR show uh, replying with a gif of uh, Shaq eating a, uh, some chicken saying, Damn, that's spicy. And then we have JD coming out with this gif saying, Selling popcorn for those that came to read the comments. Because, yeah, this seems to be very entertaining in the, a, lot of, a lot of people. Then you're down, uh, you have John Callis saying, more accredited journalist in wrestling is Alex Marvez. Well, basically plugging one of his people. Then you have Firestar Heart with somebody eating popcorn. You have just Alex doing the same thing. Uh, and then you have um, Dave Hancock of Dan, Dan, Dan uh, Dave Hancock Say, let's go to Tony for comment. Tony? And they got a gif of Tony uh, from one of the uh, Nitro Spring Breaks uh, events. And I don't think, I don't know what, what that's from or anything. You know, so yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's a. Uh, so yeah, it's really, you know, interesting and everything. And some people. You know, and some people are saying, "Oh, this has to be a work. This is Alex Cord uh, uh, Alex uh, um, is a Cardoza. Alex Cardoza is saying it. Just talk, just talk wrestling. Saying it's embarrassing. Um, you have uh, Gen X icon saying Tony being, I guess, Tony Khan, the biggest WWE fan on the planet. You have Kenny Herzog saying." LOL, it's not showing up outside your competition in a tank, but that's pretty good trolling. Some are saying easy TK. And people are wondering what's going on? And yeah, Wrestling Ops is saying finally some ounce of chaos of wrestling twin inner Covalent uh Covalent TV is saying damn with a uh, Jeff from Will Smith, a uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air. You got uh, Liv for Kai, saying, "Deal with it, brother Tony." So, so let's see. Um, it says, "Okay, so we have Will I of Pronouns Pal saying, I think the real reason TK is upset is despite his goodwill with the fans, he has nothing near the level of the Bloodline storyline." And that's pretty true. And then you have Eric Jocks of Eric J Gaming saying Tony turning heel. That's the announcement for next week. What Tony we do not know. So you know. So yeah, it says you have not. I uh, have feel from not from Fina Elixi saying, bro, watching SmackDown. Um, try and figure out how to put together a good storyline finally. And let's see. So let's see. Um, we have uh, Cody Collins calling him a cryberry baby. And everything. Someone at Fight Factory saying, wait, so you were watching SmackDown? Then you have B. Ray. Uh, B. Rye saying, I love you, Tony, but you calling Ariel a fraud? Well, one of your own main goals for the year is to end up on Dave Meltzer's book of the year. It's just crazy to me. A O I M F O I M F A O. And then you have Professor Taku with a comic of a brain saying, you know, you trying to, um, uh, at least the person's brain telling them, you know, yo, piss, are you trying to sleep? And then the person is saying yes shut up damn it what if Tony Khan is tweeting about some gangster blank and then all of a sudden that person the brain's human wakes up so yeah it's, it's gotten a lot of traction it's got a lot a, a lot of attraction you have uh, let's see Godshaw saying this is harsh to both Ariel and Tony Schiavone all because er, all because Hawani decided to do an, a WWE show and everything, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's basically got a lot of people talking. Some not really, you know, you know, not really happy with you know um, TK's comments and everything. 
some of them even using gifs of you know as of somebody asking a question what did i do basically being you know saying this would be shivani's reaction would be like what did i do and everything um uh yeah and then you have willie enigma the true mr enigma saying uh tony paying more attention to wwe than his own company that explains the drop in quality i guess and then you have a couple of gifs of people drinking um not eat drinking but eating uh cocaine which is basically uh their way of saying yeah that's probably why tk said what he did and look you know tony khan has a right to his opinion i'm, I'm not going to deny that i don't think any of us will deny that he has a right to his opinion but again to to put one of your own one of the best you know, along the likes of a Jim Ross, along the likes of a Michael Cole, along the likes of a Bischoff for his time, and even a Hudson and a Tanay and all that, during the Monday Night Wars, to to put them under the bus, if you will. To put them under the bus um, because you're mad at somebody for doing a two two day week a two day job, you know, for WWE on behalf of the one of the employees that pays them, BT, that's not a good sign for you. That's not a good look for you. That's not a good look for your company. And what you need to do is focus more on your company, you know, instead of what the other competition is doing. I mean, that's what people have been telling them. Don't focus on what WWE is doing. Act like they don't exist. Focus on your company. And that's it. But obviously, he's not doing that. Obviously, he's not doing that. And it's got a lot of people, you know, talking now and not in favor of... Uh, TK and with, and whether or not he comes out later today and said hey look I take back what I said I, I shouldn't have said that I was you know unless he comes up with a reason to apologize and say hey I was tired I had a busy day I wasn't thinking straight I shouldn't have said that I owe Ariel an apology I owe Shivani an apology he says that was, you know unless he comes out and apologizes for being unprofessional and says hey you know I, I understand Ariel was just doing like a, a two day deal that's it fine you know, and, you know, and then, you know, basically, like I said, apologizes to his own in, in Shivani. You know, unless he does that, I don't think Shivani's going to want to work there anymore. I mean, I don't even know uh, when Tony Shivani's contract is um, up with, you know, with the company because I, I'm pretty sure, uh, I'm pretty sure um, uh, that, um, let me see. Okay, his contract is until next year, 2024. So, you know, that's when numerous contracts come up. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe he has an option in there. Maybe he threw in an option to say, hey, I to, you know, hey, if anything goes crazy, I want out. You know, TK better hope. TK better hope that Shivani doesn't try to exercise some kind of option or opt out, if you will, if he has that in there because of what just happened here. He better hope not. You better just take Tony Schiavone aside and say, hey, man, I wasn't thinking straight. I apologize. I shouldn't have called you out like that or I shouldn't have threw you under the bus like that. That was my bad. You know, just, you know, humble himself. Just say, look, I was I was mad. I, I wasn't thinking straight. I shouldn't have done that. I was unprofessional. I'm not going to, you know, I'll try my best not to do that again. And that's all he can do. That's all TK can do. But right now, it's not a good look for him or his company because if he's willing to throw... You know, throw under the bus one of the greatest uh, wrestling announcers, you know, in history, especially during the Monday Night Wars, under the bus because he's mad that somebody that said his interview with him was one of the most frustrating, unprofessional ones he's done. You know, you know, if he's gonna do that because that person showed up on SmackDown to do, you know, uh, in, you know, in crowd fan interviews and reactions to the thoughts of what's gonna happen tonight. Again, it's not a good look. It's not a good look. So, you know, if I'm if I'm Tony Khan, on, I need to swallow my pride. I need to rethink about what I said, and I need to swallow my pride. That's what I need to do. But yeah, but yeah, this was uh, this blew up in a big way, and obviously, it's not a good look, like I said, for TK uh, or his company by extension. So, Tony, Tony Khan, I pray you get your act together and. Again, don't take people's advice. Maybe even those within your company that are telling you the same thing. 
Don't focus on what WWE is doing. Focus on what your company is doing. Act like that company does not exist and act like yours is the only one around. You do that, you'll be fine. You'll be absolutely fine. Anyway, with that said, let's talk about something else that came up before we get into uh, the review. Oh, not review, but the, pre the preview. Let's talk about, as I try to timestamp this here, at 25 minutes, 25 seconds, let's talk about the fact that news has come out that Jay White, uh, Jay White today in Battle of the Valley is going to face Eddie Kingston. And they've added the stipulation that uh, the loser, that if Jay White loses, he's gone from New Japan, period. You know, he's done. You know, that's it. Or if Eddie Kingston loses, he has to have permission from Jay White to compete in New Japan as well as have permission as to who, you know, he could face from Jay White. Basically, he's got to ask Jay White, can I work for you, New Japan? Can I be in New Japan strong? And can I wrestle this person? He's basically got to be on the... He's basically got to kiss up to Jay White to get what he wants. That's it. Um, and what's intriguing about this is the stipulation with Jay White that if he loses, he's gone. And a lot of people feel that the timing, you know, couldn't be better because this would you know, open things up for him to jump over to potentially WWE, you know, after WrestleMania. And that's probably something that we can look look forward to if it happens. We might even see it happen as soon as after Elimination Chamber. We don't know. You know, we don't know. But it it's uh, really it's really interesting to see, you know, where they'd be going with this um uh, after today, because you got several wrestling, you got several events going on wrestling wise. Three going on, I think, and along outside of that, you have something with NASCAR as well. But again, it it'll be interesting to see uh, exactly, you know, where they go, you know, with that match storyline wise, and whether or not New Japan will try to keep Jay White at least for New Japan Strong, or he's going to be let f he's going to be free to go. And he has made it well known that he wants to stay. He wants to be, you know back in the U.S. competing, so we have to wonder if him, um, you know, agreeing to the stipulation with a possible loss, you know, inevitable, that that's going to be his exit after a few other commitments off the field to head straight for WWE or AEW. You know, that's going to be what's interesting. And a lot of people are saying WWE is probably the more open door, and I think even Jay himself has alluded that that's probably the direction he'll go to, but we'll see. Um... Uh, but yeah, you know, speaking of Jay White, it seems that even though he is a priority for WWE, as far as big free agents go, he's not the priority. Yeah, he's not the priority. Because apparently, the major priority when it comes to major free agents is somebody else. And pretty much this person has let it be known that if he's allowed to help coach in the performance center and stuff, as well as do some other things, that he'd be willing to work with them. And that person is Kota Ibushi. Yeah, Kota Ibushi, the tag team partner in the Golden Lovers of Kenny Omega. Kota Ibushi has made it clear, or at least strongly alluded to the fact that he'll probably be WWE bound if he was to sign with a major company. Because right now, he's not tied to anybody. He's not, to, he's not tied to New Japan. He's not uh, tied to Pro Wrestling Noah. He's not... Uh, tied to All Japan or DDT Pro, you know, he's a freelancing uh, agent right now, being able to compete wherever he wants, when he wants. But he does have the goal to settle down with one company eventually, and it looks like, just by his own admission, that he's looking at WWE as a possible landing spot. Now, here's the thing. Has he worked, has he competed in a WWE ring before? Yes. We all remember that he was in the Cruiserweight Classic to crown a new Cruiserweight Champion back when that happened. And he was strongly featured. And WWE wanted him, but he was not ready to commit to that deal uh, at that time. But it looks like now he's more than willing, I guess because of everything he's gone through injury-wise and personally, that he's willing to make that commitment now to settle down in one place that he knows will be, secure, will be a future secureness for him and his family going forward so yeah it looks like by his own admission to an extent and by reports coming out you know from those within the company 
that yeah, Jay White's a major priority, but the one that tops him sounds like it's Kota, o Kota Ibushi, Kota Ibushi, that they want a little more than Jay White. Doesn't does that mean Jay White's not going to you know get signed, signed and, any, and everything, and decide he wants to go all elite? No, it basically means that you know Jay White's still on the radar. It's just that right now they want to get Ibushi, you know, first and foremost. But if they can't get him right away, Jay White's also on that radar too. So in other words, it's basically like they're going to get both, probably before or after Mania, or to show up before or after Mania, to be part of the company, and go from there. Whatever roles they play, what brands they're on is a totally different story. But yeah, it seems that. Uh, Ibushi is basically the top priority right now for WWE alongside Jay White. So basically, both Jay and Ibushi are top priorities for the company as we speak. So that's something to look forward to and pay close attention to as we move forward in the next couple of months, moving towards Mania and afterwards um, as well. But speaking of heading towards Mania... Uh, speaking of heading towards Mania, let's get into our predictions and previews. And surprisingly, we don't have that many matches. We have essentially we have essentially five uh, matches that are going to happen tonight. Uh, five primary matches that are going to happen tonight. And the first match we're going to talk about. Judy, the first match we're going to talk about is a match to where the winner <laughs> wins the grand prize of facing Bray Wyatt and Uncle Howdy potentially at WrestleMania. Whether that's, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, triple threat, or heck, by force you put two of the most powerful entities and Lesnar and Lashley on a single team, you know, against Howdy and Wyatt, it seems that the winner of this match is going to be the next victim of Bray Wyatt and Uncle Howdy and their crew. Now, does that have the potential to be good, storyline-wise, individually, or even as, you know, tag team-wise? Yeah. Because we've, because here's the thing, we've never seen Brock Lesnar outside of The Undertaker, or even Bobby Lashley to an extent, you know, be put into a situation to where, okay, you know, I'm facing an, I'm facing an individual who I have no idea where they're coming from. Or who I'm going to be facing. You know, or what they're capable of. So, so it's going to be, it's going to be really um, interesting to see where they go um, from there. You know, with this matchup between Lashley and Lesnar. Now, some are predicting that we won't get a, we won't get an exact winner. We'll get a dusty finish. We'll get a double TQ, whatever. And we're going to get one more match at, at Mania. And I'm not against that. But I think if what they're hinting at now is any indication, I think we're going to be getting, like I said, either a triple threat or a tag match or even a one-on-one -on -one at Mania with Wyatt versus Lashley or Wyatt versus uh, Lesnar. Or we're going to get a triple threat of Wyatt, Lashley, and Lesnar. Or we're going to get a tag match of Howdy and Wyatt against Lashley and Lesnar. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. So it's going to be... It's going to be really interesting to see what happens here with this matchup. Um, but if but if they are planning to go, you know, out, you know, in the direction of Wyatt next, you know, it's a toss up. I mean, either one has potential. I mean, you do have a little bit of storyline there with Lesnar and Wyatt because they tried to do something, you know, what what was it, almost uh, eight seven years ago with the Wyatt family and Lesnar. So maybe they can play off that. And then you got the potential of, you know. Bray Wyatt and his Wyatt Six, if you will, feuding with the possible re reformed uh, Hurt Business, led by Bobby Lashley, that could be something too. That could be something too, but we'll have to we'll have to see what they got uh, in mind heading towards uh, Mania after Elimination Chamber. But to me, if I'm going to give an answer here. Um, I'm probably going to have to say double disqualification. Double, it's going to, it's going to be an, I'll, I'll put it this way. My end result, no contest. 
because if they're planting the seeds for a Wyatt situation with one of them, it's going to be no contest. All right. So next up, we have Edge and Beth Phoenix against the Judgment Days, Finn Balor and Rhea Ripley. And uh, now apparently, you know, you're going to have Dominic there outside at ringside. The only exception is whether or not Damien's going to be there, depending on when that match is placed. Uh, but you're going to have Mysterio outside, Dominic Mysterio outside. Um, this this will be interesting because a lot of people are saying that, you know, you have momentum with Rhea wanting to, you know, you, you want, well, basically people are saying that you want to give Rhea the momentum uh, going into Mania, right? Because everybody's expecting Rhea's match with Charlotte and Mania, you know, including myself, to be freaking a squ to be a freaking squash is what we're expecting. We're expecting it to basically be Rhea gets in there, match doesn't even last that long, out, you know, out goes Charlotte's lights, if you will. You know, I've even said it, you know, several times in Super Chats to Alex, I, you know, just Alex, who did his uh, previews and uh, predictions with Patrick G of Patrick's Crazy Place, uh, which I haven't fully finished watching, but I even told him twice, now is the time for this to happen. And that fans want Rhea Ripley to do to Charlotte Flair what Brock Lesnar did to John Cena almost 10 years ago at SummerSlam 2014. And that's basically annihilate her. Annihilate her to where, from a storyline perspective, you can have Charlotte humbled and realize that maybe she's not as good as she says she is. And that the only reason she got to where she's at is because she's Ric Flair's daughter. And that now she has to be more of her own person to prove she doesn't need you know, to be somebody's flesh and blood, you know, to, you know, win championships the right way. They could do that storyline-wise, but we'll see. And so this is also kind of a toss-up. I mean, we are in Canada, and you would expect Edge to win in Canada. Uh, but if they are setting up for Edge and Finn Balor uh, at WrestleMania, you know, possibly in Hell in the Cell, again, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, you want Beth to get the revenge on, on Rhea, you know, officially. I mean, yeah, she has speared us several times. But you want her to get, like, that decisive revenge. And maybe even still play into what's going to happen at, at WrestleMania with Finn and Edge. So, I don't know. I mean, this is a toss-up, man. It's a toss-up, but I'm probably going to have to lean towards the Judgment Day to win. Because, again, you want to keep the momentum with Rhea. And the best way to establish that she is a monster, if you will, is have her basically dominate the Glamazon. You know, doing portion doing like maybe the last portions of the match. Like, yeah, get let Beth get some, you know, shots in there, but then you have Rhea just flat out dominate her and thus send a message to Charlotte that, hey, this is gonna happen to you, but quicker. So I have to go with the judgment day on this one. Alright, next one we're gonna talk about the women's elimination chamber match, where the winner gets a shot at the Raw Women's Championship at WrestleMania. You have Asuka, you have Liv Morgan, Nikki Cross, Raquel Rodriguez, Natalia, and Carmella. Now, some I know are probably thinking, well, since Carmella was the first, the last one in and she won her return match, she's going to be uh, the one that, you know, pretty much wins the chamber, right? And thus gives Bianca an easy day at, um, at WrestleMania. No. No, I'm not. I'm. I'm not going to say that's going to happen because, even though I will admit, Carmella, to me, I think is going to show a little bit more aggressiveness than I think we've seen before. Uh, you know, from her, I don't think Carmella is going to win. Uh, Liv and Nikki, I could see possibly getting that shot, getting that push, if you will, but I see that more after Mania. Raquel Rodriguez, I could see her maybe being like. One of the final two, three in that match uh, tonight. Uh, but I see her also getting a push after Mania. Natalia, obviously she's there because, you know, it's in Canada. I mean, they popped when she put the freaking shop shoot on Ronda last night. So, Natalia, you know, I would say she could be one of the final two. I don't know, one of the final three. But obviously this match is set up for one person and that's Asuka. Ever since she came back at the Rumble with the murder clown gimmick of her Kana persona, it's obvious that they are building her to be at Mania in a featured match. And that match is going to be against Bianca. Because you can definitely tell this is Triple H, Triple H's hand, or this has, I should say, Triple H's handprints 
all over it. You could tell that already. And to me, it's obvious that what he's going to do, maybe, unless something happens, is Asuka's going to win this match. She's going to win. She's not going to dominate. Although, I'll put it this way. She does dominate most of the field. It'll only be like for maybe 50%. Because they're going to want, they're going to probably explain to her, hey, you're going to win. You're going to dominate 50% of the field. But we need you to make uh, Raquel. We need you to make Natalia. And maybe even Nikki, but mostly Raquel and Natalia look strong, uh, even in defeat. So, you know, uh, so yeah, I think Asuka, obviously, she's going to win this. There's no doubt, because it's made, it's been, everything's been set up for her. No, I don't think anybody could deny that. But, um, again, I think it's going to be done in a way to where they're going to make her understand, yeah, you're going to get the win, and you're going to go on to Mania, maybe win there, uh, or more than likely. Uh, but we need you to make these certain women look strong so that when we push them towards you and we push them towards either Rhea or Charlotte after Mania, that it will make it seem more believable. So, so yeah, I'm going to, I'm definitely going to go with the, uh, you know, the unanimous choice of it's going to be Asuka, you know, walking out as the challenger for Bianca. And that's going to be a huge matchup there because these women have shown what they could do when they were in NXT together. Can you only imagine Triple H allowing them to do what they did in NXT, but up at a level, uh, up at, you know, 10 times more when it comes to the big stage of WrestleMania. So, again, unanimous decision, it's going to be Asuka, in my, you know, you know uh, all across the board. It's going to be Asuka. And we're going to get Asuka Bianca. All right. So, the next Elimination Chamber match is for the United States Championship. I think this is the first time it's been defended in the chamber, uh, period. But we have Austin Theory defending against Seth Rollins, Johnny Gagano, Bronson Reed, Damian Priest, and Montez Ford. And if you're wondering why Montez Ford is in there, again, reports have been coming out that he is on the verge of a big singles push um, along with you know his partner. So they're going to... So basically, I think what we're getting here is like a unique scenario to where you're going to have, you know, Angelo Darkins, who's not in the match, but you have Montez Ford, who is. This is a unique situation where both men are going to get singles pushes, you know, massive single pushes in the next coming months, but also have a legit, you know, tag team push as well, you know, at the same time before maybe eventually breaking them up. So... So yeah, um, that's why Montez is in here. It's the first step towards him getting that singles push, if you will. Uh, and then Angelo Dawkins, I think, will also be following. And then, like I said, you're going to have that simultaneous push of them as singles and as a tag team. But yeah, this is for the U.S. title. Um, this is kind of a pick em because, you know, some people are saying that if Theory's going to face Cena, you don't need Theory to be U.S. champion unless you plan... For him to either drop the title to Cena or Cena to put him over at Mania. You don't need it though. You know, depending on, you know, whatever direction you go in. Seth Rollins, you don't need it because you already got him set up for Logan Paul. Unless you want to have Seth Rollins become champion and be sort of a month-long transitional champion that, you know, then drops the title to Logan Paul. Which right now wouldn't be the best, you know, image uh, image decision. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be the best imagery decision, if you will, for WWE to do. Uh, Johnny Gagano, I think, would be a nice surprise because I don't think anybody would expect him to win. And it would at least give him something to do going into Mania. Uh, along with Bronson Reed as well. So you could give them both something as either one of them win. Damian Priest, I don't know. Again, it all depends. You know, he's been U.S. champion before and it would be nice to give a little momentum to the Judgment Day. Um, so this men's limited chamber match, it's not as easy as the women's uh, to pick. But if I'm going to go with anybody, I'm going to go with Bronson Reed. I am. Because again, you have several scenarios here to you where you could put the U.S. title on the line, you know, as part of the feud. But the decision would be kind of awkward. Like, you know, Theory and Cena, you want to put the title on Cena. It's like, okay, what's the point? You know, what's the point of putting it on him if he's not going to be here all the time? You know, it doesn't make sense. Unless they go in the direction a lot of people are hoping they're going to go in after Mania with a certain American Nightmare. You know, so there's that possibility. There's the possibility you could give it to Rollins and he can, 
that could be used to propel his match with Logan Paul and tease the fact that Logan Paul can become champion. Uh, Johnny, again, like I said, would be a nice story because nobody would see it coming. You know, Damian Priest, again, it's all about momentum. Montez Ford, that would be a nice surprise too. Maybe even by winning, tease a little bit of a dissension in the um, in the ranks of uh, the Street Profits. But if I'm going to go with anybody here, I'm going to go with Bronson Reed. And I think what will happen is it frees up you know, Bronson to have something to do, or at least have something that's going to allow him to do something at Mania. And I think the person he's going to do it with is going to be Johnny. That That's what I think. I think they're going to give it to Bronson Reed, and Johnny's going to be involved at when it comes to Reed at Mania, and I think the other two will be Ali, and it's going to be Dolph Ziggler. So I think Ziggler, Ali, you know, Gargano, and Reed are going to face each other in a fatal four-way at Mania for the title. I, I just got that feeling. I just got that feeling. So I'm going to go with Bronson Reed. I mean, again, Johnny would be a nice choice, nice surprise, but I'm going to go with Bronson Reed, and then that's going to tie into Johnny getting the shot at Mania, along with Ali and Ziggler. Then we get to the main event. The singles match for the undisputed WWE Universal Championship. Roman Reigns against Sami Zayn. You know, this this to me is one of those situations to where, you know, you have, you're doing everything right. You're basically checking off all the correct boxes when it comes to this match. You're having uh, Cody Rhodes endorse Zayn to win. And possibly be his opponent, his more favorable choice at Mania. You know, you you have you have that you have that checked off and everything. As well as you have basically the fact that you know, nobody there's no real confliction, if you will, when it comes to this, and you've pretty much set up Roman to be the heel that he's always needed to be. Like, yeah, he's been a heel, but he's always had fans pretty much on his side. This is a scenario where that's not the case. This is a scenario where that's not the case. And, again, you know, you have a lot of variables. You have a lot of variables because this is a situation that, like I said, every box has been checked off perfectly. Nothing has been, you know, left out. Nothing has been, you know, unfocused. Everything has been perfectly done. To a T. And the question being now is, you know, where do you go from here? You know, what what's the end result? I mean, like I said, you have Cody Rhodes endorsing Sammy, saying he'd be more favorable facing him, which would be a great matchup in its own right. And everything. So you basically checked off, hey, there's no there's not gonna be any dissension and that whatever fans are behind Sammy right now, depending on what happens uh, tonight, those fans are gonna transition over to Cody to see if he can do what Sammy couldn't. So you know, so everything's just working out perfectly. I mean the storyline is great. I mean in, I mean and here's the thing. You had Sammy Zayn tell Cody Rhodes to his face. You know, before Cody pumped him up and said, hey, I, people have said, and it's time for me to finish my story at Mania, and I intend to, no matter what. I mean, Cody's basically saying, it doesn't matter who I face at Mania, I'm finishing my my primary story, and that's to become champion. And for him to endorse and tell Sammy, you need to finish yours, again, that's a box checked off to where there's nothing going to be left on the table, there's no dissension with fans. You know, fans trying to hijack or anything. You got everything laid out perfectly. You've learned your lessons from the past. But again, you know, this is a scenario where things are done so perfectly, even to the point that, again, you know Triple H is helping with this, along with Michael Hayes, believe it or not, to where uh, basically Sammy's told Cody, look, you know, when he asked him, do you think you can beat him? And Sammy's like, I don't know. Because he says, and, and, and the fact that he's telling Cody, who potentially could face Roman at Mania, saying, hey, you haven't seen what I've seen. You know, you haven't been in the camp. You haven't been in the huddle. You haven't been in the planning room, the war room, you know, with the bloodline, with Roman. You haven't seen what I've seen. You haven't seen what they've strategized to cover all the bases to make sure he stays on top. You know, you haven't seen what I've seen. And, oh, by the way, when he says he's in God mode, in guard tier mode, if not above that, that's not a saying, that's a fact. That's the truth. What you see in this ring is what you get. 
And, you know, when now in, in his thing, if this was under Vince's pencil, if this was under Vince's pencil, uh, penship, you wouldn't have it. You wouldn't have Sammy doing that. You'd have Sammy basically saying what he did tonight. You're going down. Or last night, Roman, you're going down. That's that's what you would have. So again, this is this is a, a situation to where things are so played up perfectly and checked off so perfectly that the booking decision is it's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine exactly where you're going to go with it. You know, like what direction, right? I mean, I mean, here's the thing. I, I, I've alluded to this on several occasions. They could tonight pull a Lex Luger. And what I mean by that is back in uh, 1997, in August of 97, the week leading into Road Wild, what did they do to not only get people to tune in to Nitro and everything uh, the week prior, you know, what did they promote the week prior or so for people to tune into Nitro the following week, the week leading into Road Wild and everything to gain viewership numbers as well as get people's attention on the pay-per-view itself, what did they do? What did they do? They delivered the Road Wild main event early on Nitro and had Lex Luger beat Hulk Hogan. Yeah, beat him by submission and become WCW World Champion. Yeah, it lasted for only barely a week and everything. It lasted for only barely a week and that's fine. But still, it happened and by extension, it did not ruin the moment that we got at Starcade in December with Sting beating Hogan, controversial or not. It did not ruin that moment. So for me, when I look at something like this, you know, when it comes to the Sami Zayn situation and Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes, I could see them pulling off a Lex Luger-like moment in Sami's hometown tonight. I could see that. I could see them having Sammy become champion and maybe holding it for at least maybe a couple of days and Roman maybe invokes his rematch clause on Raw Monday, wins them back, or at least holds off till next Friday on SmackDown and Roman wins it back then. Guess what? At least you're, at least you're throwing a little bit of a twist in there like, okay, Sammy won, so it looks like it's going to be Sammy and Cody, but then you have Roman invoke his rematch. Sorry about, sorry about that, my battery just died on me. But anyway, that is something that they can do. I mean, they could pull what WCW did. They could take that playbook, that story out of that playbook and say, hey, well, let's do that tonight. Give Sami Zayn his moment, if you will, and let him be champion for at least a couple of days, maybe a week, and then he drops it back to Roman, and you're back to what you are originally planning for Mania. Because, again, you're throwing that little twist in there to where you give Sami his moment in his home country, in his hometown, and, you know, basically, basically you build off that. You build off the fact that, okay, now it's Zayn and Rhodes at Mania, but then you have Reigns invoke his rematch clause for Raw or SmackDown, win it back, and then you're back to Rhodes and Zayn. That's what you could do. Because, again, when WCW did this in 1997, nobody expected it to happen, you know, days prior to the actual match happening at Road Wild. I mean, yeah, they were still going to get the match at Road Wild, but they didn't expect you know, to get, you know, a, an early preview of it, you know, six days prior where Lugo would win it, you know, in Detroit at the Palace of Auburn Hills. You know, nobody expected that, but it happened. It happened, and it showed that, you know, you think it's going to go this way, but what if we, what if this happens? You know, what if the unpredictability happens? And to me, that's something they could do tonight. They could give Sami Zayn his moment. Tonight, you can give him his moment, and then even if it only lasts 48 to 72 hours, if not a week, fine, you know, fine. Have him drop it back to to Roman, you know, you know, on Raw or on SmackDown the following week. You know, let him drop it back to him, and you're back to Rhodes and Reigns. But still, nobody would expect it to happen. Nobody would see it coming, and you could still use the rematch where Roman would win his championship back to basically basically set up the Usos and Owens and Zane. That's what you would that's what you could do. That's what you could do. You could do the and you know and nothing would be truly affected. I mean you throw in that twist of this could happen. You know, or this might be where we're going, and then you have the rematch happen and there you go. 
And then on top of that, you can have Roman, as I've mentioned before, you know, use the stroke, use the pool that he has as tribal chief and head of the table to have Sammy's win at Elimination Chamber expunged. In other words, wiped from the history books, wiped from the record books, and basically act like it never happened. And thus keep counting how many days he's going on as champion. Because right now he surpassed, what, 900 plus days? You know, he wins tonight. We know that 900 plus days, hey, what is it, 905, day, 903 days, would be the actual, you know, length of his reign. It would be the legit, you know, length of his reign, you know, before he dropped the title to Sammy. But if, again, if you have Sammy do what he did, or do, if you have Sammy, like I said, not do what he did, but you have Sammy win tonight and everything, and then drop it to Re Reigns a couple of days later or a week later, you know, on Raw or SmackDown, I mean, I mean, the fact if you have that happen and everything, and then you have Roman Reigns use his pull, you know, as head of the table, Trouble Chief, to expunge it from the record books, to expunge it, you know, from history, and act like it never happened, even though we have visual evidence that it did. And then he just keeps touting on like, eh, you know, nothing really happened. And instead of like 903 days and everything, he just continues on saying like, where am I at now? 920 days? 930 days? You know? And to me, you get, and to me by doing that, you get him more heat. And not, to, not only do you get him more heat from the crowd, because of what he did by expunging Sammy's, you know, expunging Sammy's moment, his win from, you know, from Montreal. Not only do you get a more heat from because of that, but you get more momentum behind Cody because you can have Cody come out and say, no, you ain't pulling that crap. We all saw what happened. You are not about to wipe away or try to expunge or try to act like what happened in Montreal never happened. Because it did. We all saw it. People that have the, and you could use it to advertise WWE Network on, on the Peacock. Is it Peacock Network? You could have them say, hey, everybody can go back on WWE Network and see that it happened. It's like, you're not going to pull that crap. And then maybe you could have Cody say, hey, come Mania, I'm damn sure going to, I'm damn well going to make sure you don't pull that crap. You know, because not only am I going to take those two titles away from you personally, but I'm going to make sure you never probably get another shot at those titles, titles because you're too much of a, you're, you're not a true tribal chief, you're, you're, or you're a coward, or something like that. Basically, you know, basically you would give Cody a reason, and fans a reason, to see Cody become champion, and to make sure Reigns loses any power he has, that, you know, in his current status. So, so to me, again, you know, it's just, you know, it's just a situation right now that we're in to where you could go that route. And and you could still go, you know, and do the stories that you want. You could have, you know, like I said, Sammy get screwed out of the titles, you know, by losing them back to Reigns because of the Usos on Raw or SmackDown. You could have that still set up Owens and Zayn and the Usos. You know, you now you're still and you still keep trajectory towards Rhodes and Reigns at Mania, and you give Rhodes more of a momentum, more of a reason to want to take this guy down, because now all of a sudden he's abusing his power or any kind of pull that he has to make sure, hey, I didn't lose. I don't know what you guys are talking about. I didn't lose. You know, so, so you could do that. You could do that, and it would still work, and nothing would change. In fact, in fact, the fans would be would be eating it up more so. They'd be eating it up more so. You could do that. Or you could do what people are expecting. You could have the Usos, who apparently are, according to Dave Meltzer, cleared to show up in Canada. You could have them show up tonight, mostly Jey Uso, and have them cause, mostly Jey, uh, Sammy the match, and go from there. You could have that happen. And then you set up the Usos against Zayn and Owens at Mania. You know, so, so yeah, there's a lot of places you can go with this. There's a lot of directions you could go with this as we head into WrestleMania. Again, you could do the Lex Luger um, situation. You can. And even if it's for a couple of days or a week, still, it would not, like I said, it would not really detract from anything. It would make people wonder, but it wouldn't detract. So... Yeah, there's a lot of different scenarios you could go with here, which is why this is, this to me is a toss-up. 
it is a it is a toss up without a shadow of a doubt in my opinion it is a toss up so i don't know i don't i don't really know i mean i i'm going to just say say it this way whichever direction they go in it's not going to affect anything Ever, you know at all going into mania in fact it's going to make things more intriguing it's going to get people more invested in everything and it's going to want people to see if they do what i think they're going to do ooh, tonight and into the next week or so if they do what i feel they could do and need to do that all it's really going to do is not only put more heat on roman it's going to get people more behind cody to see him finally dethrone this guy and make sure he doesn't you know, not only does he not lose his, cha not only does he lose his championship, it's easy for me to say, but that he also loses any power and pull he has, you know, along with it. So, so yeah, again, I'm just going to say wherever they go, direction-wise, booking-wise, I don't think it's going to affect anything. But, that's about it, guys. That's all I'm going to say for my previews and predictions. Like I said, you know, as far as the matches go, I think Lesnar and Lashley are going to be no contest. I think Judgment Days, Finn Balor and Rhea Ripley, because you got to give Rhea momentum going into Mania. Um, I think they're going to win over Beth and Edge, but you know you'll have something in between there to set up for Balor and Edge, maybe held to sell Mania. I think Oscar is going to win the Women's Elimination Chamber match. I mean, everything has pretty much been set up since she's returned as the Murder Clown, her Kana persona. You know, I, I think everything has been set up to. Sorry about that, uh, but anyway. You know, anyway, I think everything's been set up to be in her favor when it comes to that. And I also think Bronson Reed's going to win the U.S. title, and that's going to set up something with him and Johnny, him and, um, and then by extension, Ali and Ziggler at Mania. And then I think, you know, as far as the main event goes, you know, like I said, depending on where they go, it's not going to really affect anything. I think it might even help it in the long run. That's just my opinion. But let me know what your guys' thoughts are. Do you agree with my predictions and everything, my preview? Let me know down below in the comments and in the live chat during the premiere. You will get an audio podcast version of this, uh, hopefully before I leave for work today. But let me know what your thoughts are, guys. Love to hear from each and every one of you. Check out the Teespring store in the, uh, depending on how you watch this. Let's see where you would watch this. Mm, turn this way. Yeah. The left hand, yeah. Check out the Teespring store by clicking on the icon on the left top left hand store, uh, left hand uh, portion of the video at the end here. Also check out the other videos, uh, previews and predictions from people like Just Alex and I think even JD um, as well in the other corners, upper uh, upper right hand corner and bottom left hand corner um, as well. Excuse me there. But guys, let me know what your thoughts are and until then, I will talk to you all later. God bless. Take care.